If it's Monday, the Russia threat. While the fight to fund the war in Ukraine remains stalled on Capitol Hill, Russian troops make their first significant territorial gains in months as Ukrainian troops, short on supplies and manpower, are forced to retreat. Plus, with just days to go until the key South Carolina Republican primary, Nikki Haley sharpens her attacks, accusing former President Trump of being weak on Russia as he compares his legal problems to the death of Russia's opposition leader. And the U.S. is considering sending more weapons to Israel, even as the country threatens to launch a ground invasion of Gaza's southernmost city, where more than a million refugees are taking shelter. Hello and welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Ryan Nobles in Washington. And the congressional impasse here over aid to Ukraine is having devastating consequences on the ground there. With a key city in the east falling under Russia control over the weekend, marking both a battlefield loss and a symbolic loss for Ukraine just days before the second year anniversary of Russia's brutal invasion. Over the weekend, Ukraine withdrew from the city of Avdika, where soldiers have been forced to ration their ammunition because of dwindling resources. The White House is hoping that the fall of Avdika, combined with the death of Putin's most vocal critic in a Russian prison, will be a gut check for lawmakers on Capitol Hill who failed to pass any additional funding for aid to Ukraine. President Biden said today that Republicans are making a, quote, big mistake by not responding to Russia. And he again urged Congress not to walk away from our allies in need. They're making a big mistake not responding. Look, the way they're walking away from the threat of Russia, the way they're walking away from NATO, the way they're walking away from meeting our obligations is, is, is just shocking. I've been for a while. I've never seen anything like this. Now, Biden isn't alone in calling for Congress to act. The ongoing war in Ukraine was a major focus for leaders gathered in Munich for the annual security conference. The NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg and Ukrainian President Zelensky both spoke about the urgency of the moment. What I can say is the vital and urgent need for the U.S. to decide on a package for Ukraine because we need that support. And we have burden sharing between Europe and Canada and the United States. So now it's for the U.S. to deliver what they have promised. Do not ask Ukraine when the war will end. Ask yourself, why is Putin still able to continue it? And on Meet the Press yesterday, the House Intel Chairman Mike Turner expressed optimism that Congress would break through the current logjam on funding. Well, President Johnson has made a number of public statements committing uh, to finding a pathway for the aid for Ukraine. Uh, I believe him. I think that we will. Uh, and this does need to get done. This is absolutely critical for U.S. support uh, for Ukraine and to oppose Russian aggression. But right now, despite the urgency on the battlefield in Ukraine, despite the death of the Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, which President Biden has blamed on Putin, and despite the newly revealed intelligence that Russia is developing an anti-satellite weapon, Congress doesn't appear any closer to passing an aid bill. And joining me now to talk more about this, our team of reporters, NBC's chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, is on the ground in Ukraine. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is at the White House. And NBC's chief foreign affairs correspondent, Andrea Mitchell, joins me on set. Uh, Richard, let's start with you. Uh, obviously, Russian forces have taken back this key Ukrainian city. What's the significance of that city? And how much concern is there that this is the sign of a dam breaking for Ukrainian forces? Well, I think you, you hit it right there. It's a concern that this is the dam breaking. Uh, Avdivka has been a hard fought uh, place. The Ukrainians have been struggling to hold on to it really since the, the earlier war here, since the war in the Donbass, going back to 2014. This is a contested uh, area, not a big city, but something that the Ukrainians and the Russians have been battling uh, back and forth over for a long time. So the loss, which was really the first Russian significant material gain uh, in almost a year, uh, was a blow to, to Ukraine. Not because the area is so big. Um, this is not a, a huge city. It's, uh, we're only talking about 20, 30,000 people. But because it was so uh, contested, because the Ukrainians held on to it for so long, 
and then had to retreat. This was a decision that the Ukrainian military made that holding Avdivka was not worth it, was not worth the, uh, the, the men, was not worth the troops, uh, was not worth the women. Uh, so they decided to have a strategic withdrawal. And as we saw a year ago with Russia, once you go into a withdrawal phase and once troops start pulling out under duress, things can co collapse quickly. The Ukrainians, if you remember, and, and we're now in the second year, so the things so much has changed in these la uh, at the, at these milestones. When the war first began, U uh, Ukrainian troops were defending themselves as Russian troops were rushing across this country as fast as they could to get to Kyiv. That didn't work. Then Ukrainians were pushing as fast as they could to drive the Russians back to their borders. They got them to a certain degree, roughly where, where I am right now in eastern Ukraine, and then things stopped. Now, the Ukra now it is the Russians that are on the advance. And these, these glacial shifts of as one side takes territory and the other recedes uh, uh, are happening. This time it is breaking in Russia's favor, and troops here say the only way to change this dynamic is to get an immediate influx of, uh, of arms and ammunition uh, primarily from the United States. And that is something you hear not just from soldiers, not from, from politicians. I was at a school today and I interviewed children at the school. There are about 30 kids there, little kids, some of them under, most of them under, under 12 years old. And they told me that they need more weapons, that this country needs more uh, support to defend themselves. Because even in this little school, they're hearing the Russians getting closer. They're hearing the artillery getting closer to their homes. And they realize without outside help, they're in deep trouble. And Richard, let's turn to another major development in that region. Alexei Navalny's family demanding the release of his body. Is there any updates on the efforts to recover his remains? And what more are we hearing from his wife? So his, his wife is taking much more of a, a center stage role right now. She was always active. She was always a, a loyal companion with, with Navalny, always at his side. Uh, but now with his passing, she is emerging as a, an opposition figure unto herself. So she gave this, uh, this, this speech today uh, on YouTube, which was uh, Navalny's preferred platform that he used to develop his, his bona fides as an anti-corruption activist, attacking uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, trying to showcase some of his, uh, his wealth, his mansions uh, all across uh, of Russia. Now she said that the, the, the struggle needs to continue, that she felt torn about it, but that she wants to be active in, in, this, in this movement. It's, it'll be very different for her. She's in, in exile, but she has a lot of name recognition. She has a lot of contacts and now a lot of sympathy. People who are shocked and appalled that, that Alexei Navalny died so suddenly in this Siberian gulag. Um, about the body, the family has not had much success. Uh, the Russians have treated the family and Navalny and his lawyers, the entire group, like enemies for years, and they seem to be treating them that way right now with a great deal of suspicion. When his mother and a lawyer went to a morgue not far from the penal colony in Siberia to try and recover his body, uh, they say they were not told information. They were uh, the staff was completely uncooperative, and they were physically forced out the door. Now, according to a Navalny spokesperson, they are trying to get more information, but they believe that the Russians are going to hold Navalny's body for another two weeks uh, to carry out some sort of unspecified forensic tests. And they believe that is a cover up, that the Russians are trying to hold the body long enough that any evidence of poison uh, would would be difficult to find. OK, Richard Engel on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, Richard, thank you for that. Gabe, let's turn to you now. Uh, you know, obviously we're at an impasse here between the Congress and the White House in terms of getting any sort of aid uh, to Ukraine. Uh, is the White House willing to negotiate with Speaker Johnson or any other congressional Republicans to get a deal like this across the finish line? Well, Ryan, the White House feels that at this point it had negotiated with Republicans in the Senate and then Speaker Johnson killed that bipartisan bill. So there's a great deal of frustration and skepticism here at the White House that any further meeting with Johnson would yield anything. But the president was asked about that today. And President Biden said that he'd be happy to meet with Speaker Johnson, quote, if he has something to say. 
That remains to be seen, and there's no official meeting yet scheduled in the books. Ryan, the last time those two leaders met was January 17th. And they've, never, and they've never met one-on-one, -on -one, which is something that uh, Speaker Johnson has asked for. Obviously, mm -hmm. the White House is also looking at providing long-range missiles to Ukraine. How realistic is it that the White House could get those weapons to Ukraine? Well, the big question right now is that, you know, the White House and the Biden administration says they need that supplemental bill in order to fund that. Now, you're right. These are these longer range attackums, uh, the uh, tactical missile systems that the Biden administration has already provided medium range missiles. But the Ukrainians have been asking for quite some time these longer range missiles. And the White House says uh, that, you know, the supplemental funding bill is needed in order to replenish the U.S. stockpiles of these weapons. So unlikely at this point that those long-range missiles would be delivered until Congress acts, Ryan. Okay, Gabe, thank you. Let's I turn to you now, Andrea. And you, of course, just got back from Munich, where all these world leaders have been discussing all the topics that we're discussing today. I mean, what is the reaction there? How concerned are they about the U.S. continued support for Ukraine? They are so concerned. This is a a global crisis, and they have just put up $54 billion. They even got hungry Viktor Orban mm -hmm. to go along with it. it. It had to be unanimous from the European Union. So all 27 countries came together and put up all of this money just about two weeks ago. And the fact is that just one call or two or three from Donald Trump suggesting that they had somehow not contributed to NATO, were not paying their way, which is not the case. Mm -hmm. Most of the countries now are up to 2%. Some are well above it. The United States is actually, you know, 14th or 15th in NATO contributions. Estonia is way exceeding us per capita. Mm -hmm. So other countries are leading the way. And the, the, <laughs> the mood this time, I've gone to Munich every year, you know, two years ago, the U.S., took the extraordinary step of declassifying data to show that within days there was going to be an invasion. No one believed it. Uh, Zelensky barely believed it, didn't want to acknowledge that even to his populations, but came and dramatically spoke to the audience. And then again, he was there and he said, you'll love this covering Congress as you do in the other part of your job. He said to this crowd of world leaders and the congressional delegation, bipartisan House and Senate, Dictators don't take vacations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when the House had just left on a two-week vacation. Mm -hmm. When Lindsey Graham, who had never before missed Munich, had always gone with John McCain as his wingman, had named our congressional delegation, Codell congressional delegation, McCain, right. in his honor. Mm -hmm. He was honored there on Friday night with Cindy McCain leading the way. All of the leaders were there, but not the speaker. Not a whole lot of representation by MAGA Republicans. There was J.D. Vance. There was Pete Ricketts, mm -hmm. who was in cycle. He's, you know, was appointed. He's now running. And he actually had kind of a cringy moment on the stage. He was with the Estonian uh, foreign minister who's been targeted by, you know, and actually is in danger. She's been targeted mm -hmm. by Putin. And uh, he was calling for the Ukraine aid, and she challenged him on the stage in front right. of all of these hundreds and hundreds of people and said, you voted against it in the right. Senate. Right. And so the audience started jeering him. So that was kind of not a great moment. But it was mostly a bipartisan group. But as you know better than I would, not the globalists, not the internationalists, right. not a whole not lot of people MAGA people. Not the people holding it up. Yeah, right. Not the people yeah. holding it up. But they were all saying, and there were some very good vote counters there, including Nancy Pelosi, mm -hmm. but Hakeem Jeffries and others on the House side saying, there are you know, large majorities to pass this. It has to get to the floor. There are ways to do it. And I was saying, well, the discharge petition, right. that's 218 votes. You know, they have to sign it. That creates well, that's vulnerabilities. Right. And, and let's talk about that because I, I think what it, <laughs> that's what I always find mystifying about this because I, I, I agree with them from my own reporting that there probably is enough votes to pass this. But the big problem is getting it to a right. the floor. And there isn't some sort of magical procedural motion that they can pull out of their pocket to get around that 218 threshold. Yeah. How can they find five, maybe 20 Republicans that are going to break with leadership to get this bill to the floor? They were all assuring me that this was going to happen. And it could be magical thinking. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Zelensky was very powerful, and the fact that Navalny, Navalny had just been killed, mm -hmm. and you know now his body even being held back from his mother, and as Peter is pointing out, long enough for the Novichok, which is only made you know in right. Russia and the former <laughs> Soviet Union, it's, mm -hmm. it's what they used to try to assassinate him the last time, right. and then he courageously went back. She appears by surprise right after Vice President Harris spoke right. on stage, 
with the incredible dignity and emotion of the moment, gets a standing ovation. And then Zelensky met with Harris, and he said very pointedly, we need the Attackums, as Richard was reporting, um, as you were reporting with Gabe. We need the Patriots. We've made big advances in the Black Sea, which they have, but we need the Patriots, we need air defense to protect the granaries, to protect the Black, the black Sea ports right. so we don't get shut down. That's the grain that's going out mm -hmm. to the rest of the world. It's a big economic factor. Their GB, you know, you know their, um, their gross national product is up. They're doing really well on the economic side. And he's, he gave examples. He said, you know, yeah. our troops are in the trenches, in these muddy trenches. And what are they listening to? They're on their cell phones, tracking the inaction of yeah, the House of right. Representatives. Well, we could talk all day about this, Andrew, Sorry. but we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your reporting, and, and yeah. I'm glad you're back safe from uh, Munich. Thank you for being here. And coming up, responding to Russia, I'll speak to a member of the House Intelligence Committee about the fate of that critical aid to Ukraine and what he knows about the threat of Russia's possible space-based weapon. You're watching Meet the Press now. There's only plan A which is to ensure that Ukraine receives what it needs. It is my full belief that were the supplemental package, the security package, to make it to the floor of the House of Representatives, that it would actually pass. Welcome back. That was Vice President Harris standing next to President Zelensky during a joint press conference at the Munich Security Conference this weekend. The vice president underscored America's commitment to Ukraine, adding that there's no room for political gamesmanship when it comes to Ukraine fighting against Russian aggression. Joining me now is a Democrat from Illinois and a member of the House Intelligence Committee, Congressman Raja Christian Morthy. Uh, and uh, Congressman, thank you so much for being here. Obviously, you've seen the reporting on what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, they're forced to withdraw from the eastern city of Adipka. How much responsibility do you and the rest of Congress bear for that city falling into Russian control? At least some responsibility, Ryan. Uh, I think the, the biggest problem that we see is that the Ukrainians don't have the artillery that they need to hold off the Russians at this point. By some estimates, the Russians are firing upwards of 10,000 artillery shells a day on the front, and the Ukrainians are firing about one-fifth of that, about 2,000 shells per day. So we're seeing a big mismatch, and it's going to only grow, and it's going to have some severe consequences. You know, it seems like at each stage of this war, there are these new uh, developments that happen, and the expectation would be that that would lead to some sort of change uh, in your colleagues that appear to be opposed to Ukraine funding. Do you think that perhaps this is the, the, the dam, uh, this would, could potentially break the dam, and when you come back, there's the opportunity that that supplemental bill will get to the floor and ultimately pass? Possibly. But I think what we're seeing is that Trumpism has infected the Republican House conference we saw what Donald Trump did in tanking the border security bill, and now he and his allies are doing everything they can to prevent this aid bill from moving forward as well. Now, a number of my Republican colleagues, uh, of course, in the Senate bucked uh, this particular request and decided to pass it out of the Senate. The question is whether we can get enough of our Republican colleagues in the House to do the same, for instance, by adding their names to the discharge petition which now has roughly 210 to 215 signatures, needs more Republicans in order to get to the magic numbers. But if we can do that, then we can actually bring this bill for consideration on the floor. All right, let's turn to uh, another aspect uh, of what's happening with this threat from Russia. And I want to play uh, for you some of what Chairman Turner told Kristen Welker on Meet the Press yesterday about why he decided to raise an alarm last week about the national security threat related to a Russian space capability. Take a listen. The threat is very serious. Everyone who's looked at it uses the same language that, that I have, that it is a very serious threat. And I, I'm, very, I'm very glad that the administration is beginning to take action. Uh, we met with Jake Sullivan, and he began to lay out a plan uh, that hopefully would begin to address this. We need to make certain that we avert uh, what could be an international crisis. I was concerned that it appeared that the administration was sleepwalking into an international crisis. Uh, what is your reaction to the intelligence? Were you surprised the chairman uh, came out so publicly about his concerns? And were you concerned at all about how the administration was responding? Well, first of all, I was supportive of the chairman's decision to share 
the intelligence, the underlying intelligence reports with our fellow members so that they could make informed decisions about how they felt about the situation and engage accordingly. Um, I don't necessarily think that we should, you know, be airing a public request to declassify the intelligence. Um, so I, in that regard, I disagree. But overall, I think with regard to the administration's response, I'm glad that they are formulating plans to deal with this uh, anti um, satellite capability. And most importantly, they're engaging our partners, friends, and allies. Uh, I think they did this in Munich. And they're also talking to China and others who would be equally adversely affected were this capability to materialize. You're also the ranking member of the, the China Select Committee, uh, so you're an interesting person to talk about uh, in this space. So if Russia is developing an anti-satellite capability, is there the possibility that China is also working toward a similar wet weapon system? Should that also uh, be something we could uh, be concerned about? And could it spark another arms race? I can't get into classified information, but we should be equally concerned about any other country, whether it's China or others, developing anti-satellite capabilities, um, because you're exactly right, we're gonna start an arms race in space. And that would um, you know, disrupt the way that we've been thinking about space for many years. And although at this time, that anti-satellite capability is mainly kind of directed at satellites and not at humans on Earth or property on Earth, you could see a day where that changes. And that would again, uh, change our whole understanding about deterrence. And, uh, you know, it basically creates a more unstable situation, much more unstable than we have right now. I want to get you to weigh in now on uh, some comments made by your colleague, Rashida Tlaib. Uh, she's urging Democrats in Michigan to vote against President Biden in the primary. The, the goal here would be uh, to raise her concerns about the situation uh, with Palestinians uh, in Gaza. Uh, what is your response to the Congresswoman? Do you think that this is the right tack to get the administration's attention to the humanitarian crisis there? I respectfully disagree. I think that President Biden uh, needs all of our support because re remember, what is the alternative? Donald Trump is a horrible al alternative on so many levels, whether it's with regard to the Middle East or whether it's with regard to our democracy. So the stakes could not be higher. We need to stand with him and make sure that even as we try to harmonize our own internal differences of opinion with regard to policy and make sure that we uh, kind of go in the same direction, so to speak, uh, that we not give Donald Trump any space to take advantage of the situation and gain an edge on us politically. Obviously, you know uh, about how Michigan has a very significant Muslim American population that is very frustrated about what's happening in the Middle East right now. What can President Biden do to mend this rift with the more progressive wing of the party who are upset with the way this war is playing out? I think they want to see outcomes right now more than anything else, more than talk or more than any speeches could possibly assuage their concerns. And I think the Biden administration is working tirelessly right now to bring a, a pause in hostilities, a humanitarian ceasefire, a truce, whatever you want to call it, because that's essential for various reasons. One, we have to have the hostages released. And two, uh, we have to have humanitarian aid in much greater quantities flowing into Gaza to help people there. At the same time, I'm very glad that the Biden administration, working with others in the region, is talking about the two-state solution, which me and others have been spearheading as being equally important to anything else that we're talking about on the ground today. Mm -hmm. Because if there's not a light at the end of the tunnel where the Palestinian, Palestinians are able to govern themselves, in an independent state, then we're gonna just see an endless cycle of violence and that's completely unacceptable. And then finally, I need to get you on this topic uh, because you've been so outspoken about the security risks associated with TikTok. And the Biden campaign took a little while, but they did finally join that platform. It's an effort to try and, and connect with younger voters. I mean, how comfortable are you with the president and his campaign being on TikTok? I'm not gonna tell the president how to communicate. Um, that's uh, not my purview, but I don't personally have a TikTok account uh, either on my government device, which is by the way, it's prohibited for all members of Congress. 
um, but also on my personal device. And the reason is very simple. TikTok is owned by a company called ByteDance. ByteDance is a PRC-based company which is beholden to the Chinese Communist Party. And in repeated hearings now, under sworn testimony, we've heard various officials of the government and otherwise explain to us how China-based employees are able to both manipulate the algorithm underlying TikTok and also to access U.S. user data uh, in ways that uh, go against what TikTok says is even possible now. Mm -hmm. And that's why, at the end of the day, Chris Ray has said that TikTok screams out with, quote unquote, national security concerns. And so um, I'm going to continue to uh, look at the situation uh, very carefully um, and, and try to work on a bipartisan basis to deal with it. I mean, you're so outspoken about this, sir. I mean, is it a bit hypocritical for the president on one end to push for a ban on government uh, owned phones uh, and then at the same time extend he and his campaign out on this platform? Well, I think that it's one thing to ban it on our government devices. Um, I think it's another thing to do it on a personal device or a campaign device. But at the end of the day, I'd like to give the, the Biden administration the authorities through legislation to actually force a sale of TikTok. It, we don't want to see a ban of TikTok. I don't want to see it go, go, go dark. And heaven knows many of my young constituents uh, use it in so many ways, including for dance videos and the like. But we just don't want TikTok to be owned by a company beholden to an adversarial regime. Right. OK. Congressman Roger Christian Morthy, we got to a lot of topics, sir. I appreciate your patience with all of that. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. And Thank coming you, up, Ryan. what's next for Nikki Haley with just five days to go before the Republican primary in her home state of South Carolina? She's escalating her attacks on the front runner. But is there anything that she can do to derail Trump's march to the nomination? You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. With five days to go until the Republican South Carolina primary, former Governor Nikki Haley is campaigning in her home state today, slamming former President Trump for, quote, siding with a thug by encouraging Russian President Vladimir Putin to invade NATO countries. Haley's also accusing Trump of playing the victim in light of his multiple court cases and once again blaming him for Republicans' recent losses. Then he has a court case and he loses. And then he loses another court case. And he goes on a rant and talks about being a victim. Then look at his record. He lost it for us in 2018. He lost it for us in 2020. He lost it for us again in 2022. Republicans lost a bill on Israel. They lost another bill on Mayorkas and the border. The Republican Party chair lost her job. And Donald Trump's fingerprints were on all of it. Everything he touches we lose. How many more times do we have to lose to realize that maybe he's the problem? Well, despite that sharpened rhetoric, Haley still faces an uphill climb in her home state and beyond, with a recent poll showing her trailing the former president by 36 points. Joining me now on set is Amy Walter, who is, of course, a publisher and editor in chief of the Cook Political Report. Uh, so, you know, to her credit, she's already given us uh, a roadmap to which we should judge her performance yes. in South Carolina. And she's saying she just has to do better than she did in New Hampshire. That was 43 percent. That poll tells us she's going to fall short of that. What, what are our expectations for Nikki Haley to survive beyond South Carolina? Yeah, it's a really good uh, point, because in South Carolina, even if you do get 40 percent, 43 percent, you don't get any delegates. This is a winner <laughs> take is, all, all state, which for, is right. right. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's a nice sort of emotional victory, mm -hmm. but it doesn't get you any delegates. And as we move along in this process, as we head toward Super Tuesday on March 5th, so many of the states, including really big state like California, mm -hmm. they award their delegates based on how, cl if, it, if a candidate gets over 50%, you can win all those delegates. Mm -hmm. So again, getting 40% doesn't get you anything. Um, in a couple of other places, getting 40% might get you a couple delegates, but not enough mm -hmm. to stop Trump's momentum. So that fundamentally is the question going forward, which is, what does Nikki Haley want to do? What, mm -hmm. is, what is the sort of off-ramp for her? Mm -hmm. And what does she do after South Carolina? I, I look at the number 
ultimately about, about how, how good she can do, how well she can do in South Carolina based on where Trump's number is? You know, in the polling, what we've seen is Trump basically hit his polling numbers. He was getting 51, 52 in the polls. That's mm -hmm. what he got in mm -hmm. New Hampshire and Iowa. So he's right around 60 percent. So she can maybe get 40 percent. But as I said, no delegates what, what come with that. What does that do for you? Right? Yeah. And I mean, South Carolina does have an open primary, which she certainly yes. benefited from in New Hampshire. But is it different in the Palmetto State than it is the Granite State? Um, there is definitely talk among some in South Carolina about, you know, providing uh, maybe disaffected Democrats or independent-leaning Democrats or maybe even Biden-supporting Democrats mm -hmm. of showing up and giving Nikki Haley some support. Mm -hmm. But I do think there's a limit to that, um, especially since we saw that the Biden team went in and worked the crowd very hard, yeah. Democratic crowd very hard, especially in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. Where could I see her doing a little bit better among sort of Democratic leaning voters, independent leaning voters, in and around Charleston, white voters mm -hmm. in and around that area, maybe the sort of wealthy retiree types mm -hmm. that have been moving away from the Republican Party and certainly don't want to see a Trump second term. Yeah, so she has been taking Trump to task uh, this yeah. this week, actually the past couple of weeks. Yeah. She really seized on those NATO comments. We played that a bit from her talking about the losing streak that Republicans have been on uh, since Trump became their, uh, you know, kind of de facto leader. Is any of it resonating and is it just too late? It, it does feel like it's not breaking through in part because voters see the same polls that we do. Right. And those polls that show that Donald Trump is leading Joe Biden, especially in the key swing states, they say, well, hold on a minute. Mm -hmm. If Nikki Haley says she's the stronger candidate, but Donald Trump's beating Joe Biden, right. how, how right. could those two things be true? And so what you see in poll after poll is it's not that those voters in South Carolina don't like Nikki Haley. They liked Trump more, but they still have good feelings for her. Mm -hmm. It's just that they see her as more of a risk, actually, right. for, as a general election candidate than the known commodity that is yeah. Donald Trump. I, I'm interested in your thought process of the, the exit ramp, as you That's call right. it, for Nikki Haley. And, and what happens to her next? I mean, I think there's a very limited chance that she wins the primary. Does she become Ted Cruz and kind of track back to Trump? Or does she become Liz Cheney right. and go a complete different that's, direction? I mean, what, I mean, maybe that's impossible to predict. It's impossible to predict, but it's exactly the right question. You know, I talked to a lot of folks who are in that Liz Cheney mold, who are desperate to have a new leader right. of that movement, who are hoping that she will not ultimately endorse Donald Trump, mm -hmm. that she can be not just a voice against the move to Trump, but she can take her voters right. and move them away from Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. It feels a little bit like what we saw with the Bernie Sanders voters mm -hmm. in 2016. Um, yeah. Bernie Sanders ultimately endorsed Hillary Clinton, but many of his voters were not interested not in supporting. enthusiastic yeah. about it. Right? Yeah. Great conversation as always, Amy. Thank, Thank you so you. much for being here. I appreciate it. After the break, pro-Palestinian and anti-war protesters now confronting the president in a new place, TikTok. That story's next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. Despite some criticism from the international community and calls for caution from the United States, Israel appears poised to invade the southern Gaza city of Rafah if Hamas does not release all hostages. Benny Gantz, a member of Israel's war cabinet, reiterated yesterday that the invasion, invasion will take place by March 10th. That's the start of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. The Biden administration has urged Israel not to go forward with that ground operation without a plan to protect civilians, including the more than a million Palestinians who evacuated from other parts of Gaza and are now sheltering in Rafah. NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez joins me now from Tel Aviv. So does the invasion of Rafah just seem inevitable at this point, Raf? So, Ryan, Israeli leaders are saying they are determined to go into Rafah. They're saying that city, the southernmost city in the Gaza Strip, is Hamas's last bastion. They say a number of Israeli hostages are being held there, and they did rescue two hostages last week from Rafah. Is it inevitable at this point? You heard Benny Gantz, member of the Israeli War Cabinet, saying that if Hamas decided to surrender, did decide to release the hostages, then this invasion of Rafah wouldn't go ahead. That does not look at all likely. 
And as you said, more than half the population of the Gaza Strip, some 1.4 million people, are sheltering in Rafah right now. These are families that have been displaced from their homes in the north by Israel's offensive already. They fled to Rafah, believing it would be safe for them there. And now there is this threat from the Israeli government that they are going to push into Rafah. They say that they will come up with a plan before they launch any offensive to move those civilians out of harm's way. But the message from the United Nations, from other humanitarian groups, is there is simply nowhere safe at this point for that many civilians to go. Ryan. Yeah, and the IDF also released new video today of the Bibas family, which was taken hostage on October 7th. What does the video show and what do we know about why the IDF is releasing it now? Right, so Kafir Bibas was 10 months old when he was kidnapped from Kibbutz Near Oz, along with his older brother, his mother, and his father. He's now a little over one year old. He's the youngest hostage known in Gaza. Hamas has said that this little boy, his brother, his mother, were killed in an Israeli airstrike. Israel has not been able to confirm that, but today they are releasing video which they say shows the Bibas family being kidnapped on October 7th in the city of Han Yunus. In terms of the timing of this, the Israelis are saying that they recently found this video as they searched a Hamas facility in Han Yunus. It comes as there is a lot of pressure here in Israel on the Israeli government to go back to the negotiating table and make a deal to bring the hostages home. We had CIA Director Bill Burns in Cairo last week sitting with officials from Egypt, from Israel, from Qatar, hoping for a breakthrough. And instead, those talks stalled. Prime Minister Netanyahu pulling his negotiators back, saying that Hamas's demands at this point are delusional and there is no point continuing these negotiations until Hamas changes those demands. But a lot of anger on the streets of Jerusalem tonight where people were protesting outside the prime minister's residence. Right. OK, Raf Sanchez, uh, live in Tel Aviv. Raf, thank you for that. And President Biden's unwavering support for Israel since the Hamas terrorist attack on October 7th has created a problem for him with Muslim and Arab American voters, as well as with younger voters and progressives. NBC News campaign embed Alex Tabat has more on the anti-war protests that are now dogging the president in the digital world. From this... To this. The pro Palestinian protests that are becoming more frequent at Biden events are now following the president online. Earlier this month, Biden's re election campaign officially joined TikTok. Jason Kelsey or Travis Kelsey? Mama Kelsey. I understand she makes great chocolate chip cookies. And ever since, the comment section on some of those videos are being flooded with posts about Gaza. I didn't do it for any other reason that I hope maybe we are heard. Jeannie Nisulu is a mother of eight from Colorado who made this comment on a Biden TikTok. Nisulu voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016 and Biden in 2020. But in 2024, I just can't in good conscience vote for that. She says the president is going to have to change his Israel policy if he wants her vote. Biden has got to step up and do something and put his foot down and say sanctions. We're cutting off aid. He needs to get control of Netanyahu. Biden's been increasingly critical of Israel's war in Gaza in recent days, even as his administration works to get Israel and Hamas to agree to a temporary ceasefire. The conduct of the response in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip has been um, over the top. Jack Lobel from Voters of Tomorrow, a youth voter turnout group, says not much should be gleaned from Biden's TikTok comment section. While uh, this crisis has, has led to more posts on TikTok. It's not changed the fundamental choice that our generation faces and regularly makes nowadays, um, which is to vote against Donald Trump. Donald Trump goes against everything Gen Z stands for. But polling paints a more worrying picture for the president. The latest NBC News poll of registered voters showed that only 15 percent of respondents aged 18 to 34 approve of Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza. <laughs> which might result in young voters staying home come November. I'm not voting for any of them.
any of them. Rania Ayub was a big Biden supporter in 2020. It was a no-brainer in 2020. We absolutely could not have a Trump administration. So I voted for Biden, and I encouraged a lot of people to do the same. But she plans to sit out 2024 entirely. It's past the point of no return. I think the Biden administration and Joe Biden himself has shown us all, um, and I'm including myself as an Arab American, that he doesn't see us as important, um, <clears throat> except when it comes to his polling. And Alex Tebbett joins me now to talk more about this piece. You know, Alex, I'm, I keep thinking the advice I was given a long time ago, never read the comments, especially on social media. But I mean, I think TikTok is a little bit different. Talk to me about why the TikTok section of the comments is a little different than it might be on some other social media platforms. Well, Ryan, the Pew Research Center recently came out with an analysis of all the different social media companies, and it showed that TikTok users are significantly younger compared to X or Twitter users. When you look at our own NBC News polling, it showed that voters 18 to 34, only 15 percent of them approved of Biden's Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war, which might explain the frosty reception Biden's been receiving in the comment section on TikTok. And what do you think concerns Biden and his team more? Is it the anger that is being displayed on these social media platforms, or is it the apathy? I mean, he needs these young voters to come out and actually participate if he hopes to win in November. Well, Ryan, we reached out to the Biden campaign for comment about their frosty reception on TikTok. They declined to comment. But what I can tell you is I've talked to some of those voters who left comments on his TikToks, and they are expressing anger. Voters like Rania, who voted for Biden in 2020, she says there's nothing Biden can do to win back her vote. And she lives in the key swing state of Arizona, where every vote counts. Yeah, it could be the difference between a couple thousand votes here or there. Alex, thank you so much for that report. Fascinating. We appreciate it. And up next, we'll have more on Biden's struggles with his own party as he looks ahead to November, as his likely rival, former President Trump, hits the campaign trail after a week of major legal developments. You're watching Meet the Press now. And welcome back. Our panel is here. Benji Sarlin is the Washington Bureau Chief for Semaphore, former Maryland Democratic Congresswoman and NBC political analyst Donna Edwards, and Sarah Matthews, a former Deputy Press Secretary in the Trump White House. So, Benji, President Biden, he's got really two different problems on his hand in terms of uh, foreign policy issues right now. He's facing pushback from his own party over the handling of these Israel-Hamas uh, war. And then he's got a Republican House that's still blo blo blocking Ukraine aid. I mean, what paths does the president have here to try and get around these impasses? Well, there's only so much he can do as, on his own. Ultimately, Congress has to approve uh, whatever package goes out that likely combines aid to Israel and Ukraine, though that itself is a question that they are dealing with right now, how to package all these things. And the big thing he's waiting for now is any sign from Speaker Johnson on how he expects to proceed with this. Now, the White House has been reluctant until pretty much just today, <laughs> to even entertain the notion of talking to Johnson, because it seems like he has no idea what he's even asking for, what kind of credibility he has within his conference. And until they have a sense that he, of what he wants, what he is actually asking for, and whether he can deliver the votes, uh, th they seem to be just kind of stuck. Sir, would it make any sense to bring Speaker Johnson into the room and have this one-on-one -on -one meeting that he seems to crave with the president? I mean, I think it would make sense, but unfortunately what's happening with the Republicans in the House is that there really is no leader for them because Speaker Johnson is not leading their conference. He is quite literally a puppet for Donald Trump. And it's unfortunate for a Republican like me who thinks that the war in Ukraine is of the utmost importance and that we need to see Vladimir uh, Putin defeated there. And I would keep in mind uh, and tell those Republicans like Speaker Johnson, who is reluctant to pass this aid, is that 74 percent of Americans think in a recent poll that the war in Ukraine is important to U.S. national interests. And so th they should be representing the American people's interests and not just Donald Trump's. Mm -hmm. So, Donald, let's shift and, and talk about the other issue that President Biden's dealing with, and this is the, the conflict with Israel and Hamas and, and kind of the growing backlash to the way uh, Bibi Netanyahu is prosecuting this war. Uh, what's your reaction to Congresswoman uh, Rashida Tlaib urging voters in Michigan uh, to vote uncommitted in the Michigan Democratic primary to send 
send a message to the Biden White House. Do you think this would be effective? Well, I don't think it's a great strategy, to be quite honest. But what I do believe is that the president really has to address these issues. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, it's incumbent on him to really face uh, both his party and the American people. Um, and I think he's, he's failed in that mission um, up until more recently. Um, and more recently, he's actually, he's, you know, said straight up that he doesn't support the Netanyahu strategy, that he thinks that it's broken, that um, it's unacceptable to have this number of civilian deaths. And what I hope in terms of the election, it, it's not too little mm -hmm. too late. Are, are you concerned by that? Are you concerned that young voters in particular may just stay home because they're concerned about the way Biden is handling this? Well, look, I'm concerned, but I think that there's enough time, but there's a lot of work to do. I mean, it mm -hmm. isn't just repairing uh, that relationship with young voters and building trust with them. But really, this concern about Israel Hamas splits not just with young vo vo voters, but really uh, throughout the Democratic uh, mm -hmm. electorate. And so there's a lot of work that the Biden administration has to do on this. So, so Sarah, let's talk a little bit about how Nikki Haley is handling uh, the way that Donald Trump has responded to the death of Alexei Navalny, the way he's handled the situation with Vladimir Putin's rise. Um, I want to read a little bit of what uh, Donald Trump had to say about the death of Alexei Navalny. I'm not going to read the whole statement, but he says, the sudden death of Alexei Navalny has made me more and more aware of what's happening in our country. He calls it a slow and steady uh, progression with crooked, radical left politicians, prosecutors, and judges leading us down to a path of destruction. I don't think anyone is surprised that Donald Trump made a situation about himself as opposed to the issue at hand. But to your point earlier about, you know, Republicans traditionally were very much concerned about Russia's encroachment. Donald Trump doesn't seem to be understanding the, the gravity of Navalny's death. Is there any way that Nikki Haley can take advantage of this and reach out to those uh, Republican voters in particular that can, are concerned about this? Yeah, I think that she has been taking advantage of it. Obviously, we've seen on the campaign trail she's gotten more and more aggressive in her attacks on Donald Trump. And on this issue in particular, she seems to have really seized on it and is trying to capitalize on it and appeal to those voters like me who are disappointed with the kind of fall from the Republican Party in which I don't recognize this party anymore. This isn't the party that I grew up um, in and that I claim to be a member of it. I don't really recognize it anymore because I think that it's disappointing when you see a statement like that from the leader of the party where Donald Trump is refusing to condemn the murder of um, mm -hmm. Navalny. And and I think that he kind of admires Putin in a way. And he uh, thinks that maybe there's nothing wrong with what happened because Donald Trump has a said that this 2024 campaign is all about retribution for him. Well, this is what retribution looks like in right. a country like Russia. This is what happens. And so I think all Republicans, including Nikki Haley, should be uh, condemning Donald Trump for his uh, comments like that. And so I'm you know, proud that she is doing so, but I wish others would be following suit. Too. I mean, he doesn't even mention Putin's name in this statement, Benji. Is that a pretty glaring omission? Is it purposeful? Yeah, I mean, what stands out about this statement is that it's just so vague and disconnected to the situation that it could be read as meaning anything. I mean, mm -hmm. before Trump was president, he used to do these kind of funny tweets where some celebrity would die and his whole commentary would just be, Muhammad Ali is dead. And that would be <laughs> right, it. That'd be right, the whole tweet. Right, right. This is really not that much different, just with a bunch of gibberish tacked on afterwards, but it's mostly baseline campaign rhetoric at this point. And as usual, it's just kind of tough to read him on this. And it, but it does seem in many ways that the Republican primary is already baked, right? Does this really have any kind of an impact on how Republican voters are going to treat the South Carolina primary that's coming up? Um, likely next to zero. We'll find out very <laughs> soon. But yes. it is relevant because... Um, the way Nikki Haley talks about this is exactly the way that Joe Biden talks about right. this. These are voters whose votes may be up for grabs in the general as well. Right. And they are, some of them, paying attention to how it shakes out in this primary. Is there is there something to be said about that, Donna, that maybe it doesn't resonate in a Republican primary, but general election voters are already paying attention? Well, I think general election voters are paying attention because they care about Ukraine. They care about um, being able to uh, offer a, an affirmative um, statement against Vladimir Putin, something that not just Donald Trump, but Republicans in the Congress have yet to do. And I think it's really important on this issue of funding of Ukraine. I mean, that funding bill is still sitting there. That is one way to push back against Vladimir Putin. And I think Republicans um, across the board should be supporting this. And here they sit um, with Ukraine still waiting 
and fighting this war against Putin. But back to Nikki Haley, Sarah, and Amy Walter and I talked about this earlier. What direction does she go when the dust settles here? I mean, very little chance she can win the Republican primary. Do you think she just turns around like many of her Republican colleagues and just endorses Donald Trump? Or could she be that voice for disaffected Republicans like yourself? Very quickly. Um, she has said right now that she has not um, said that she's going to endorse Donald Trump. I don't know if I fully believe that. Um, I am hopeful that she will stick to that and she just won't endorse anyone. I'm not saying she has to go out and endorse Biden, right. but hopefully she will not be endorsing Trump right. if she drops out. Okay, we've got to leave it there. Thank you guys all for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now, but NBC News coverage starts right now with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.